Well, hello, free people of the Rocky Mountain region. Many property owners have been shocked at the high property tax evaluations they've received in the mail here in Colorado in 2023. Property taxes are, are complicated, and politicians have been taking advantage of this situation to advance their anti-Tabor agenda. Well, Natalie Menton and I will be presenting a video series detailing the property tax situation, as well as presenting Liberty solutions that you can use. This is our first video, and I want to thank Natalie for being here today. How are you, Natalie? I'm doing great. How about you? Doing very well as well. So thank you very much. I'm really excited to present some information and get some of the, uh, re you're such a great resource for the Liberty community. So to get a lot of information out of you that people can share and share these videos around to really understand the property tax situation, what we can do to lower our property taxes, and hopefully expose some of the lies of the pol the politicians who are trying to scare people into giving up their Tabor rebates. I look forward to it. I think the big picture view here on what we're doing with the video series is providing solutions that will really boil down to uh, local input uh, from those who are wanting to make a difference, change the course here of what we've got as uh, the future outlook on property taxes, and know that um, watching these videos is going to empower them to be able to take those steps. So I'm looking forward to it a lot. Awesome. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun, a little bit different uh, than what we've done in the past, where it's more of us just talking, actually having a, a presentation, some uh, something people can watch and kind of follow along and and actually get online and, and check some stuff out. We'll see in some future videos. So perfect. Perfect. Right. So we'll get started here. I think uh, part of it, what we want to do with this first video is to provide an introduction to people, kind of give you the background about why property taxes are in the news this year, why why the headlines have been everywhere, why the governor and his legislative lackeys have been glad handing and talking about uh, the wonderful solutions they're presenting and how this is going to affect our November ballot. So we're going to kind of go back in time a couple of years and take a look at, at how we got here. That sounds like a good plan. Um because there, there's been a game plan by some of those who want to, as you noted, dig further into taking away our taxpayers' bill of rights piece by piece. And I think there's a bit as a big pie, and they've already taken a couple grabs, a couple slices. And we need to, as we say, change that course and uh, get involved with citizens, showing them how we can do this. So if you want to lead it off with the history or you want me to go yeah, so our first little slide here talking about uh, the Gallagher Amendment. Yeah. So, you know, the Gallagher Amendment, there's a lot of talk about that even now. It was first adopted by Colorado voters in 1982 to, quote, protect homeowners from rising property taxes. You can go on the legislative website and read a really great report they put out back in 2020 about the fiscal impacts of the Gallagher Amendment and how it maintained lower property taxes for residential homeowners. Yeah, and... What, what they were really going after here was the fact that because of the rising values that we were starting to see, the mill, uh, the assessment rate itself, which is really the part where the state legislature gets involved and sets the assessment rate for what used to be residential properties, non-residential properties. Now there's a bunch of classes because they really started to make sausage down there with property law. But the removing the Gallagher Amendment basically was to stop that assessment rate from continuing to go down to counteract the higher property taxes themselves that people were paying. So there were a lot of special districts um, that were involved with this, but there were also some, some really big donors who helped push this through the legislature and put it onto the ballot. At the end of the day, they made it sound like it wouldn't impact property owners to a great extent. And we see now that the concerns that are being brought forward about affordability and the amount of the taxes going to the government and people being really priced out of their home almost because they're house rich, home rich, in a sense, they don't have any intention of selling or anything, but they're getting hit with those higher property taxes really when they haven't gained anything at this point yet, but they're paying the taxes on that alleged gain. And that's, you know, that's the sad part with property taxes, um, that when people are, you know, facing fear over whether being able to pay the bill, and it's not like a voluntary 
type of transaction where the government says, you know, send it in without, and if you don't, there's no recourse. We're talking about tax liens if you don't pay your property tax bill. So anyway, back to, yeah, the Gallagher Amendment um, put in place by Dennis Gallagher, who then went on to be uh, City and County of Denver's auditor, who has since passed away, uh, put that into place. And it was Senate Bill 20-223 that led to what we knew as then Amendment B and repealed this lowering of the assessment rate. And, you know, as we move on, you can see there, we've got uh, local districts that were chiming in, trying to persuade voters, probably investing public dollars. Frankly, I've been around long enough to know that when a government body wants to oppose or support something, they're supposed to be limited by Colorado law, but in some cases, may not always be true. So here we've got a school board passing resolution, which is allowed by law, but I, I've seen personally where some districts, and I'm not saying RE1 Valley School Board, but some others have crossed the line on spending public resources on opposing or um, supporting a measure. And unfortunately, if it was all about protecting citizens and lowering taxes, I don't know how much I would complain, but typically uh, their mental uh, thought process is to build bigger and more um, well-funded government. So, Definitely. And I think some of the context, too, of what was happening in 2020, we all remember those that year, those months, especially in early 2020, when the world turned upside down. And I think a lot of these state government agency government agencies, whether state or local, you know, realize they they need more tax money. As this quote here from the uh, Valley School Board, quote, the resolution states that repealing the Gallagher Amendment will prevent a loss in desperately needed funding to help support schools as they weather the economic toll of the global pandemic by mitigating the effects of the cuts and allowing schools to maintain essential services to students, families, and the community. So early in 2020, we saw this big push to get Amendment B on the ballot to actually repeal Gallagher with this type of language, of course, that these government agencies wanted more of our tax money and started the campaign. Yeah, and there, and there really wasn't a, a notable effort to defeat Amendment B from those who do want to protect Tabor, uh, keep taxes low. I think there was a lot of distractions, as you noted that year. And you... You've got uh, the concurrent resolution here, which drafted the language. Yeah, part of the one of the important parts, I think, with this one is actually seeing this resolution, seeing who the bill sponsors were, because when you talk about property taxes and how high they are now, there's people responsible for this. This just didn't happen out of the blue, right? I mean, we have a list here of these legislators, people who were legislators, at least back in 2020, who put this on the ballot, who pushed this to Colorado voters. And as you've mentioned earlier, in a kind of deceitful way to almost trick them into giving up their their lower property tax rates. So, of course, you know, we had Senate President Leroy Garcia and Speaker of the House, Representative Casey Becker at the time, who both signed the resolution to get it on to, to pass that language, to get it passed on to the voters and get it sent over to the Secretary of State for that November 2020 ballot. But I think it's very important also to look at the list of names and, uh, you know, there needs to be some accountability among voters among get grassroots activists that some of these politicians at least should share some of the blame in my opinion for um for our higher property taxes that we have now and i can speak to because i, I saw this firsthand uh that representative soper who was actually one of the on the bill sponsors uh just during this last spring um during a committee meeting so this wasn't like one-on-one -on -one exchange or something um expressed his his uh, how remorseful um, he was that he had even supported uh, this uh, repeal of the Gallagher Amendment. And that was actually, ironically, during the testimony about Senate Bill 303, which uh, is what Proposition HH is, um, kind of seeing these moving pieces that were starting to build, not certainly it was government action that was not helping the, the regular citizens. And this is proof right here with where we've ended up after the repeal. And like I say, really no organized effort and, and activists look back and regret that. And I think that's what we are really trying to go with these. this video is showing that now that we've dug into this spot, 
there are some ways out, but it takes, it does pay, take people getting involved and at the local level, but there are lots of benefits to what we're going to be talking about and how to dig into it in this way versus perhaps such as a special session where we're giving the control to them. This is, this is like war really. And there needs to be a plan where there is a greater chance of success um, as long as there is all of that involvement. So getting off track a little bit and do, I guess where we're going to go with this video, but we'll, we'll keep talking about the history for the moment. Yeah, I love it. No, definitely. There's a lot we can do at the local level. I'm really excited to get into that piece. You know, I really believe that local level activism is the most important thing somebody who believes in liberty and freedom can do. But I, I do think it's important for our people out there to, to know the history and to know the background, to be able to speak intelligently on this on this topic and really understand the nuance. Because as we said before, our property taxes are very complicated. And the more we know about it, the better we can fight. Like you said, we got to fight smart. Yeah. And this is probably a good time. I want to just throw this in now because we'll we'll go into a little more depth later in the series. But for those who have a mortgage, so sometimes maybe they're not paying that physical bill, the mortgage company paid the property tax bill, or a tenant who's affected by property taxes, but they don't get a statement in the mail about the property taxes. Um, and this even goes to business owners, is that if you look at the line items on the, all of a, a property, let's start from the beginning. Property tax bill has your property, the designation by the parcel, da da da, and the values, but then also has a listing of the local governments that um, get property taxes. And not one of those lines or government bodies is the state of Colorado, not one of them. The only interaction the state really has on a big level here with this property tax process is it sets the assessment rate. It all just determines property classifications. We could go into that later in another video. We tried to cap property taxes a couple of years ago and the state legislature changed the, class, changed the classification of the property and kneecapped the citizen petition drive so, but really back to, before I go ranting off there, is that the state really, their involvement is setting that assessment rate, um, trying to make it as least complicated as possible for the assessors and people to understand how properties are, are taxed. Um, and But the, the actual payments you make for those property taxes are going to local governments. So, you know, the state... Uh, and we'll show a clip later where Polis did actually talk about this a little bit, what needs to be occurring here in this dilemma. So anyway, I'm going down into the teaser road and I had to rant for a little bit, but let's go back to this article um, where we had uh, Dickie Hullinghorst um, speaking out about these impacts that were going to occur because of this repeal um, of Gallagher. Um, go ahead before I start going again. Yeah, no, I thought it was very interesting to point out that, you know, the the alarm bells were sounded early back in 2020. Uh, even a former Democratic Speaker of the House warned, quote, if the Gallagher Amendment is repealed, Coloradans can expect a much higher tax bill starting in the next tax cycle. And I love this last sentence here, quote, if Amendment B passes, it would take a sledgehammer to affordable housing. As we've seen in the 2023 legislative session, everybody's been talking about affordable housing, housing bills left and right nonstop throughout the entire year. And here we go. You know, I mean, this is really some of the genesis as to why affordable housing has been such a struggle in Colorado, looking back to 2020 with Amendment B. I agree that for you to hunt up that it. Because this this affordable housing discussion is what's led to us now already losing um, three hundred million a year that's taken out of our Tabor refunds moving forward, and it will continue to grow based upon how much income tax they collect. That this a, a, attack is multi pronged, and that was supposed to be about affordable housing, and here they kind of created this dilemma with this repeal and you know if you look back i was looking at the blue book i have to turn my head a little bit i don't know that i could find it but um i mean it was right in there in the arguments against um, amendment b within the blue book that came out that um, amendment b results in higher property tax owners prior property taxes for homeowners by preventing future drops in residential assessment rate 
So that state, the only thing the state was supposed to take care of, right? And what they do is they get rid of what was protecting the taxpayers from those higher taxes. And then you looked at the couple slides ago or one slide ago, and we've got the sponsors. And I say in Lakewood, one of them there on that sponsor list was Kennedy, who was the prime sponsor on this, this Proposition HH. They're Groy Kennedy. I mean, it's the same players creating the problem, not helping the problem, and then making the problem worse. Yes, exactly. All right. Exactly. Uh, this is a, a screenshot from the fiscal note from the legislative staff, you know, that the legislative staff puts out for every uh, resolution or bill that comes through that ha that affects taxes and affects spending like this. So you can find on the legislative website, the links there. But really, this line here, I thought was interesting, because these these politicians, they knew they knew ahead of time that this was going to be an issue, you know, they're and part of the narrative that I want to express is the fact that they seem to be caught unawares that this was going to happen and kind of at the last minute tried to come up with some sort of solution. At least that's what, they, what it seems like. But it says, therefore, barring a future legislative change, reducing rates below those required under the Gallagher Amendment, this measure will result in a higher residential assessment rate. A higher assessment rate will result in higher property tax revenue for local governments, including counties, municipalities, school districts, and special districts. So, of course, this is why Amendment B was supported by so many people in Colorado's political class because they wanted to take more money out of the economy for their own special projects for school districts, municipalities, and other types of government spending. But it was interesting to see how deceitful the marketing around Amendment B was back in 2020, as you mentioned, saying that it's not going to raise taxes when clearly the legislative staff knew right away in writing here that it was going to result in a higher residential assessment rate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the voter turnout. So very unfortunate, uh, the results of Amendment B back in 2020. This is from my uh, review of the 2020 general election ballot initiatives. Unfortunately, it did pass. As an amendment, it did need the 55% of the vote, and it did get 57.52% of the vote. Total uh, vote margin of 455,000 voters, unfortunately. And I think a lot of it had to do with that first line, as you can kind of see there, if it's, if it's not small, too small, Quote, without increasing property tax rates. Of course, who doesn't want to give more money to fire protection, police, ambulance, hospital, kindergarten? I mean, they even say kindergarten in there, right? I mean, who doesn't want to give them more money if it's not going to increase your property tax rates? But very deceitful, very dishonest. And unfortunately, mis I believe it misled the voters into raising their property taxes. Yeah. And that, you know, that's with taxpayers bill of rights. It's got very clear. Um, language that is supposed to be used in a ballot issue that increases taxes, increases the rate. It, 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 go, it goes into detail about these things. And the rules for the state legislature, when they get put the, the question together themselves, is a far different, far different um, method and uh, plan, excuse me, hold on. <laughs> it's a far different set of rules and process for the citizens initiative, whether it's a single subject, how the question is phrased. And if you put those two side by side, it's a very difficult game to win when they're able to, to blatantly check, you know, like in this question proposition HH that's coming up. Shall we have all of these services reduce uh, property taxes this way and this using the surplus. Now they crafted that question and they didn't even have the guts to include Article 10, Section 20, which is Tabor, much less the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights is what's that slight reduction that they're you know promising. So there, we need to have some fairness rules and there's actually a petition rights amendment movement out there which would address some of these things, this fairness issue. And I sat down, uh, well, I'm going to save this one for later, but we'll just continue later. We can talk about Chris Kennedy some more, the proponent of Prop HH and how the question is crafted is deceitful, um, non-transparent, and a variety of other things. And we can talk about that when we get a little later in this discussion. Perfect. So talking a little bit about the people behind Amendment B back in 2020, the people who were pushing for these uh, higher property taxes, 
Of course, as we saw earlier, you know, the school districts were coming out in favor of it. Municipalities, of course, most of these state legislators supported it because they love taking our money because they have good pl they have plans for it. And in their mind, great plans, better use of our money than we can have. But what was interesting, too, is that this yes on Amendment B was that was the issue committee, the primary one, spent nearly seven million dollars to get the measure passed. So where did some of this money come from? Well, you may know the name Pat Stryker, the Fort Collins billionaire, medical equipment heiress, and Gang of Four member who contributed two and a quarter million dollars to this Yes on Amendment B issue committee back in 2020. I mean, that's big money. It's absolutely unbelievable. You know, I I wrote at the time she can afford to pay higher property taxes with her net wealth increasing at an estimated one billion dollars this year. And this was back in 2020 when a lot of people were struggling. Not so for somebody in the medical equipment industry like Pat Stryker, who saw her wealth increase by a billion dollars and, of course, put that money to good use to help take away our hard-earned money and make it harder for us to afford our homes. Another healthcare philanthropist, of course, <laughs> quote-unquote, former DaVita CEO, Cherry Hills resident Kent Theory, a very politically active individual with lots of money to throw around, contributed another over $2 million to support Amendment B as well. So it's interesting to see some of these players, these people who have this continuous uh, continuous place in Colorado politics kind of shaping the state according to their agenda and their vision of how it should be. Yeah, I mean, we've got over half of three people contributing over over half of the campaign right there. Plus, plus all the other little smaller checks at only, what, $500,000 or $250,000 that you don't have listed here. And the opponents to this, again, because we were just, just there was a lot of commotion that year. Um, I don't even know that there was an official opposition campaign, even though we were clearly, I mean, we with that triggering it, it very obvious it was going to result in higher taxes. Um, certainly our hearts were in it, but just not enough soldiers, I guess, at that point in time to have defeated this. And it gets a little bit tough when it's billions of dollars like that and they can just throw up TV commercials and they've got um, teachers and the firefighters, um, the unions, basically as the characters in the TV ads telling you why you should do something why you should vote a certain way. And for a lot of people, you know, it's, that's a difficult challenge to get past those ad campaigns where they're paying probably the campaign manager alone. Who knows how many tens of thousands of dollars, but let's just say it's, it'll be paying for a lot of big Macs. And then uh, another big supporter yeah. of amendment B, if you want to get into this one, Natalie. Oh, I do. Um, Gary, you know, when you were starting to go through like the list, I, I, and when I spotted Gary Community Investments, it right away, right away struck me because I have a long history with Gary Community Investments. Starting back in the years, many years ago when I ran for an elected position and I was very um, big on, I wasn't going to take any special interest money in that campaign. I've actually been very solid on that as a whenever I've run for office. But this check comes out of the blue for the full max amount from a people I don't even know who they are. Well, it's this Gary Community Investments and they sent this check and I'm like, well, it's great, but I've made a promise in my my campaign I'm not taking special interest. So I eventually sh shredded the check. But since then, I've had more intimate involvements with Gary Community Investments. And that was, as, as you've got my screen noted, no on Prop 123. I don't know if that's still showing on the screen or not, but um, I was heavily involved with, along with you were and others, trying to stop Prop 123 from last year, which was diverting our Tabor refunds for a known amount of time from our pockets, where it helps us pay whether it's our mortgage, our rent, our home insurance, pays for the refrigerator, pays put food on the table, takes our Tabor refunds to put into subsidized high density housing. Well, somebody had millions of dollars to spend on Prop 123 last year, and it turns out to be 
Gary Community Investments and all the little subsidiaries that they've got, who is also very involved in a campaign um, with Deep Pockets. So yeah, I've had I've had involvements with Gary Community Investments. No, I wasn't surprised. Just funny to see the the web, the web that's out there. Um, and and again, ironic today because today I was just Mike Johnson got elected to to mayor of Denver, and I was just showing somebody because we they were talking about Johnson, a picture where Mike Johnson and I and Luke Teeter, the other proponent for Prop One Two Three, and Aaron Harbor and Penn Fifter. And we all got arms around one another because it was a photo I took after all of us debated Prop 123 last year. So, you know, this this just reminds me of all these people that have constantly been on this provide affordable housing, but it seems to be making it less affordable because that's why right now the legislature is trying to push everybody in a corner, trying, trying is a keyword, with Prop HH which is supposed to provide really appear to have no choice, which is why Brandon and I are going to be spending some hours talking about how we do have a choice and being able to control our future. So anyway, you had it right on this page, because I think this is one of your slides from 2020, where you say it's bad for liberty. Property taxes will increase. Um, that's the short and not so sweet. Way to put it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, Gary uh, Community Investments, it was headed at the time back in 2020 by Mike Johnston, you know, as I wrote at the time, you know, former anti-gun, former Democratic state senator, failed former governor candidate. I mean, they spent over a million dollars, a million and a quarter dollars in support of repealing the Gallagher Amendment in so many words, but in support of Amendment B to raise our property taxes. So I'm very unfortunate to see. Also, I thought it was pretty interesting to see somebody from the Walton uh, family, the Walmart people, James M. Walton, who used some of his inheritance to fund. He has got this wind social impact fund, which was pretty interesting as well. But yeah, it's these out-of-state special interests. It's these big money people coming in, pushing this agenda so they can take more of our tax money. And it's really unfortunate that Denver voters didn't recognize the snake of Mike Johnston, somebody who wants to raise their property taxes and take more money out of their paychecks. Well, and I guess and Mike Johnston is a really, I mean, he is like the home, like USA, home hometown USA. And he is really, you know, nice guy. But looking at his public policy here, he wants to repeal Gallagher Amendment. It's known. It's even put in the blue book. I mean, in the blue book, it's not like the gray book where people are just like thrown in, like, you know, here's more of my, my feeling. This is actually the blue books written by legislative staff. It's a big process. And they've got right in there, increased property taxes. So Mike Johnson is behind it, which is known to increase property taxes, and then comes back and says, well, everything's become unaffordable. So we got to take more government money. And, and now he's mayor of Denver. So yeah, I wonder how after, that's going to work out. After <laughs> helping to get people out of their pushed out of their homes because of rising property taxes, now there's this massive homeless issue, of course, and now he's going to solve that homeless issue, which of course is going to more involve more state involvement, more government involvement in our communities. Yes, yes. Just to uh, kind of provide some of that background, as you were mentioning, Natalie, about. Uh, Gary Community Investments and Mike Johnston. So not only in 2020, but of course in 2022, also being active in support of Proposition 123, which also took some of our Tabor rebate money, rebate money away from us, out of our paychecks, out of our pockets, basically, to fund their affordable housing scheme. So this this uh, thread that we've seen, this narrative, you know, take away our ta tax refund money, prop up affordable housing government schemes, and, you know, at the same time or within a couple of years, also raise our property taxes. So it's like, you know, where are you putting the money? You know, affordable housing programs, you're taking it out of people who, who can't pay their mortgages, you're raising their mortgages or raising their property taxes, raising their rent, raising their property bills. And then also, you know, trying to counter that with these affordable housing schemes. I mean, it's totally ridiculous. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and then as you and I've co covered in other videos, I mean, you got to wonder about that big picture plan is to how much of it is to just make people more and more dependent on government 
uh, the housing bills that you and I went into great depth and, you know, did a lot of coverage on talking about the government having the money mechanisms and then also the stick mechanisms to be able to acquire properties and turn it into more and more government managed, government controlled, taxpayer funded housing, which we call subsidized housing. And the government wants to, and we should never ever, you know, we should we should avoid it at all costs to use that term affordable housing because it's not at all accurate. Affordable housing is leaving the people alone, taking as little out of the people's pocket as possible. That's what creates affordable housing. Definitely. 100%. Can't agree more. So moving to uh, some of the calls to alarm earlier in 2022. So, you know, we see this this pass in 2020 Amendment B to to basically stop the state's uh, property tax assessments from decreasing to increase the property tax uh, taxes overall. And then, of course, um, you know, here comes some reports early in 2022. So this is January 2022. You know, these legislators, the governor, these politicians, you know, and the levers of power knew that this was going to happen. And as we'll see later, they kind of waited at the last moment, probably to push this uh, this agenda under HH. So this is from uh, January 6, 2022, from the Colorado Sun. Colorado's taxable home values could skyrocket in 2023. A state economic forecast predicts a statewide increase of up to 20 percent. But what that means for homeowners is complicated. So the report they are referencing in this Colorado Sun article is the Colorado Legislative Council staff. They have a December 2021 economic and revenue forecast that showed that that was going to happen. It's really the economic and revenue forecast they put out are a great resource for people trying to track all of this. Another report here from uh, February 2022 on coloradopolitics.com, Colorado property tax rates poised to skyrocket in coming years, report by business group finds. So Colorado Concern also had a report out showing, quote, property owners in Colorado will get hit with a 20% property tax increases on average over the next four years if the state doesn't come up with a solution. So solutions were being asked for, you know, as early as, in 2022, the, the, the writing was on the wall. It was coming, you know, the higher taxes were coming. And of course, the, in my opinion, the politicians were negligent in terms of providing a good solution for Colorado homeowners and renters. And there, there we go with the much closer figures. I mean, those last two slides were 20%. And I haven't seen anything really lower than 25, frankly, right now. That's very rare. I mean, we're finding this 40 to 50% is more on target to go. I mean, that's April, 2023. And, you know, part of the reason they said that they had to wait till the last minute to provide action was because they were still waiting and waiting and waiting for the assessments. That's a very hard response to, to swallow and accept because the end of the sales within that valuation period. So when, when we're talking about property taxes, how they come about, well, they're based upon the sales within a certain amount of time. And with June 30, 2020, 20, excuse me, 2022 being the last day of that period and with the uh, public transparency about sales, I mean, you, re you record them to the, to the government themselves. To not have an idea that we were in that 35 to 50 percent bracket, um, with, that we didn't have that information last year. I, it, I know I'm getting into the weeds a little bit, but it was that's really the government's reason for why they waited till the last minute. When, as you've noted here, you know, we at first they were saying 20 percent increase, but now we're jumping into this amount that just incomes are not going to be able to to cover this especially for those who are seniors. Um, hopefully they'll realize that they've got these alternatives out there and say no to this corner that they've been forced into. Definitely. Yeah. You know, with uh, interest rates increasing, you know, people with anybody with a variable rate mortgage, then of course now this higher property taxes. I mean, the reality is legislators, these politicians had so much time, so much time to formulate a plan, plan, pass a bill through the Colorado's legislature, get it to the governor to alleviate 
some of this property tax burden on Colorado homeowners, property owners across the state. And they, they were totally negligent in doing that. Yeah. And I, I'm going to speak at this. I know we're, we're trying to keep this kind of condensed, but I just did a public information request on the four sponsors of this property tax measure, this, this boondoggle, this um, hoax is what it is. It's hor horrible hoax, HH. And I did a Cora saying, give me all your emails and text messages uh, regarding Senate Bill 303, which is Prop HH, and House Bill 11, uh, 1311, which is something we'll get into later. And I have gotten nothing useful whatsoever out of those CORA requests to date. Uh, it's past the deadlines, frankly. And they've told me in two of the cases, uh, including DeGroy Kennedy and uh, one of the others, I'm going to make sure I've got to have it right, but they've told me over $1,000 in that I need to pay for a public information request to get whatever exchanges they were making during the course of this legislative session. And so uh, I'm just bringing that up because we knew they were having discussions for months and months and months. That's why I did the CORA, which is a Colorado Open Records Act, by the way, for people who don't know the word CORA. A lot of people know the words FOIA, uh, Freedom of Information Act. That's for the feds. So when I say Cora, that's the legal term, legal nickname for Colorado Open Records Act. So anyway, I was trying to get info on all of these exchanges and they're trying to put up a brick wall, tell me over $1,000 to get the records. And I'm not done with that story yet. Let me tell you. Great. Look Good forward to hearing goodness. more about that and finding that information out. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good article. You can talk about this one. Definitely. So Westward, of course, you know, kind of a left-leaning <laughs> authoritarian uh, news organization, in my opinion. But this article kind of typifies, you know, kind of ex exemplifies their view of this authoritarian political class in terms of of what they think of Tabor. So, quote, it says the article headline is, thanks to Tabor, some counties won't reap benefits of historic property values. So this is May 17, 2023. So, of course, the mindset is that you know, it's not about the homeowners. It's not about the people paying the property taxes. It's about the the politicians, the people who are going to use this tax money for their own agenda, for the agenda that they want to push on Colorado. So here we go. Article says, meanwhile, officials in places like Denver County, Douglas County, and other counties that have become exempt from Tabor limitations through voter approval can reap the unrestricted benefits of the high assessments without having to refund taxpayers. Of course, they think that's a good thing. Over the past three decades, Tabor has been one of the state's most controversial constitutional amendments. Only controversial, of course, in the eyes of the politicians. As they say, uh, I don't like Tabor, offers Jefferson County Assessor Scott Kurzgaard. So as you can see here, you know, they they want our pro they don't care that our property taxes are going through the roof. They're just sad that they have to give some of that money back because of the taxpayer bill of rights. Yeah, and this article uh was actually in main part talking about the counties, as you noted, some counties won't reap benefits in the way that, that, you know, another newspaper editor might phrase this title would be thanks to Tabor, voters in roughly a dozen or more counties will get propped, propped will get tax relief thanks to our taxpayers bill of rights. But you can see it different, as you noted, different editorial skills um, or choices uh, get to that point where you got these bias type titles. But this article really to me was important because out in Jeffco, where I live, we still have our taxpayers' bill of rights. And we have fought off uh, D Tabor proposals over the last tw two times over the last five years. And so what it was pointing out here is from our Jefferson County assessor. Uh, that's why they're quoting him is because out here in Jeffco, we're going to get a rebate and what we want, we are like we are due. We haven't voted away our rights. And as you can see, Scott Kurtz Kurzgaard, our assessor, may not be so happy about that, but hopefully he does his job fairly and properly with assessments and doesn't include his bias about not liking Tabor. I'm sure he will do a fine job 
Um, I'll tell you more after my property tax appeal though goes through <laughs> later in the year. But um, anyway, they are trying to uh, point out here, you know, that some counties have given away their Tabor limitations. But it should be noted since we're talking about this video and the fact that Douglas Bruce, the author of the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, um, is very clear about this. I've done interview with him. We have it on recording. Um, for prosperity, and for anybody who doesn't know, the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights never allowed giving away your rights permanently, like these these caps on revenue. It was meant to be only a four-year time out. So when you look at the text of the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, you'll see, it's, remember, it's a legal document. It's, you know, constitutional language. It's that there can be a voter, a delay in in voting for up to four years. That's where it's talking about. You can give away um, a temporary relief of for the government to keep those revenues, but not beyond four years. And why was four years chosen? Because it's the term, usual term of an elected official. So really the purpose in that was to make sure that future generations, um, their rights weren't given away by a set before a set of voters before them. So, um, meaning basically all these counties that have given up their rights, the voters, many of them early on before even a lot of people were really aware of Tabor and the impact, they gave away their rights years ago. They can actually gain some of those back. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later in this video set about how you can maybe explore that route within your own county if you happen to be one of the unlucky ones who voters years away, years ago gave up your right to taper and what you can do about it. So we're, I know Brandon and I are very excited to talk about this later on. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Solutions are, are the most important aspect to this, but we, but uh, you know, this background is so important to understand where we can, where we need to be, need to be focusing on in my mind. Yes. For sure. So getting back now to the present in 2023 here, the last part of the legislative session, you know, this bill, Senate Bill 23, 303, I think was introduced on May 1st. You know, so the last two weeks of the legislative session, almost no time at all was given for debate, for citizen input, for for people in the public to come out and actually lobby their representatives or elected officials to talk, tell them how they feel about this this uh, legislation. So Senate Bill 303. Of course, a great political title, reduce property taxes, right? That who doesn't like that? And voter approved revenue change. Well, there's the 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 details there at that end, voter approved revenue change. So as you can see here, the legislative session in 2023, legislators had 120 days to formulate and pass a bill. But of course they waited till that very end and issued an extremely complicated, very constitutionally you know, challenged bill to to push their agenda through. And I think part of their strategy was by waiting till the very end, a limiting debate and not allowing really that input and that ability for proper amendments to come through and for the public to get excited and angry about this. Yeah. And that's why I did the public information request on those four people. And the only one who has responded to me is Mike Weissman. And be, I mean, because they had to have been chatting. They had to have been getting communications from constituents because, I mean, what? yeah, you're right. They slid this in. Let me go to timing real quick because I jotted this down. This was proposed on a Monday afternoon, seven days before the session is going to end. I hear about it. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty watchful. I'm not the, you know, check the news like every other day kind of person on politics. I mean, I'm pretty and keep eye on it but like you are. This pops up on a Monday afternoon to be heard, uh, it's May 1st, pops up on the feeds uh, late in the afternoon on a Monday. They're going to have testimony the next morning in Senate appropriations. Now, here's one thing notable is appropriations in my history is not usually the house of reference where it goes. And sometimes people aren't even quite clear because usually usually goes to a committee, then they'll send it to appropriations if there's dollars attached to it. They decided to go right to appropriations. Well, nobody was quite clear what the testimony 
what option was because usually when appropriations is the second committee you don't have testimony option so everybody's a little bit confused so here it is less than 24 hours later they're going to have it heard at eight in the morning um before they go on the floor they then decided to change it to later and how many people are going to be able to scramble take off time um on a tuesday morning run down to the Capitol, be pushed off for hours on testimony. And then, then so I actually did drop everything, go down there. We've got the people on the committee, the state senators, because this was Senate appropriations. I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes. It was a jumble that week. Senate appropriations committee. We've got Barbara Kirkmeyer and other senators um, on the Republican side going, we haven't even had a full 24 hours to read what is roughly 100 pages between the bill itself, the fiscal note, Hansen was presenting, uh, one of the sponsors here, and uh, Fenberg, you know, really no apology that they're running this last bill, this bill at the last minute. And especially because, as you noted, they wanted to slide it in, saying, yeah, we've got property tax relief, but didn't want to mention that that so-called surplus that they're using to pay for it is actually our taxpayers' bill of rights refund. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to sit there in, in testimony and hear this and to be able to, you know, the communication, this test, <laughs> the public input was just shut down. Another reason why I want the Cora, I want to know what exchanges they were having with people because what was present on the floor was actually despicable. I mean, you go all the way down there and you get two minutes with to testify, maybe three if you were lucky. You have legislators who haven't even read through this stuff yet. Very difficult to have all of your questions together in a very condensed way to be able to go through them when you're trying to still digest the bill. And then testimony from legislators was shut down, which is what led to the Republicans walking off the floor. Anyway, I keep going on with that, but that was a Senate appropriations meeting. There was one other that week, week where day that week where I was able to testify. That's when it jumped to House appropriations. They were supposed to have this Saturday morning testimony at eight in the morning on a Saturday. I check the agenda at like 730 on a Saturday. I see that they've moved it. I go on to a ward meeting. I come home working in the garden, listening to testimony on my headset, which is just what you want to do on a Saturday afternoon in your garden, right? And I, okay, they're going to go to committee as soon as they adjourn. So I'm sitting there listening. They're getting ready. They're getting close. Great. I'm going to drop everything. I'm going to drive down there because I want to testify eyeball to eyeball about this stuff, right? I don't want to do it virtual. I want to, you know, anyway, I, anyway, I hear at the last minute they have, uh, added on this House Bill 1311, which is the thing that's going to tie into this HH, and we're going to talk more about it. But it basically says everybody can get a refund even if you didn't pay in when they're using this. It's got some carve outs, etc. Rush down there to the Capitol. They're already hearing this House Bill 1311 before we even get to 303. The only point I'm trying to make here, oh, and then I sat down with Chris Kennedy, the other sponsor here, and told him that his bill um, was misleading. It was not transparent. His response was, we can agree to disagree. I said, yeah, that's about right. So, and then I said, so you don't believe in transparency? He said, well, I'll think about it. I mean, we're sitting there on the bench. This is why I like doing it eyeball to eyeball, right? And he is my house rep. Rep, I put that quote, unquote, right? Because it's not. I mean, we disagree on most things. Anyway, point being, he knew he'd been told that the title on this bill, the, the question being presented to voters, where it says, we're going to give you all this property stuff using a surplus is just, it, it, it's just horrible. That is just disrespectful. It's not following what the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights said the question should be framed as. Um, I'm starting to go off a little bit, and I, I know you're, yeah, some people may enjoy that, but I'll let you chime in a little bit here before I keep going. 
No, I love it. No, it's uh, I really appreciate you test your testimony actually being able to be down there. It was so such a scramble that last little bit of the legislative session. I mean, there was no time to mount opposition to this. It was just dropped in there, rammed through, and presented as the only solution for property taxes. I mean, it was truly despicable that these politicians want to pull a fast one on Colorado citizens to say, we're gonna take your tax refund money, money that you maybe need to pay your bills. And use it for some scheme when they didn't need to do that. I mean, that's the most dishonest thing is that it was not the only way to reduce property taxes. That is an absolute lie is for these politicians to say this is the only way we're going to reduce your property taxes. The only way they want to reduce property taxes is by stealing our other tax money. But it's it's truly shameful. It is. It is. And there was a legal challenge for, um, I don't know that we have that in the slides, but just to mention it, um, a legal challenge, the court See, in, in Colorado, you have to have, whether you initiate by citizen to put something on a ballot or the state legislature, either one, either one, shall be a single subject. Well, there's so many parts tied into this Prop HH that, I mean, it deals in school finance, local governments, um, a variety of things. So it's being legally challenged. The courts, a district court, Denver District Court, already said they really didn't have jurisdiction to really rule on this. So it is going to get appealed to the Colorado Supreme Court. And so there's still hope that maybe the court will say, you know, this is a deceptive title, number one. And when I say title, that means a question. That's jargon for ballot title, but it's the actual question. How is it phrased? So I, I just want to clear that up in case I keep saying it. Um, but also that it contains multiple subjects. Again, different set of rules. If you had citizens initiating some of these things, their chances of getting through the title board might be quite difficult. Definitely. And it actually reminds me of what happened in 2020 with Amendment B. Amendment B was challenged for, for the language and the the judge said he didn't have jurisdiction over the state legislature. You know, he's a separate branch of the government and couldn't overrule what they said. So it seems like there was no accountability and nobody actually being able to stand up for the voters, for the individuals of the state, the citizens themselves. If the judicial branch is not going to intervene or get involved as they did in, in 2020 about Amendment B, then what are the people supposed to do if these legislators are just going to be dishonest and screwed around the Constitution as as they as they like to do? Yeah, and that um, it's timely then to mention there's two two things that are should be mentioned. One is the whole petition rights amendment, which would revise the process and make a much more equal level playing field on how ballot issues are presented, the rules, um, because this has been going these shenanigans have been going on for a long time. Um, but then also John Caldera just had um, in a proposed citizen initiative that any uh, referred measure by the state legislature that would have to have the question phrased by the title board, which is that body of three lawyers who right now phrases how the citizens' questions are. Mm -hmm. So basically it's saying whether, well, it's taking out the legislature's hands, which right now based upon their behavior, which is quite childish, um, deceptive, I mean, childish is putting it really mildly, it's playing games on, on phrasing a question that you know is deceptive, misleading, a long list of words in the dictionary will cover the negatives in how they're trying to slide this by the average voter, especially, you know, they talk about voter integrity, election, all that, that they know there's people who are not going to be able to study the blue book because they hustled them in. They didn't have time to read the, the 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 blue book in depth. They're going into that voting booth and they're voting based upon simply how it is worded. And when they use the rules in their favor, that's just cheating the system. It's just plain cheating the system. Anyway, sorry, I went off again. No, it's great. Go, please continue with that. <laughs> I, I I thought the Ballotopedia um article here about about this proposition was interesting because it does mention you know second line here allow the state to retain and spend revenues that it would otherwise be required to refund to residents under the Colorado Taxpayers Bill of Rights Tabor 
to give local governments to make up for the decreased tax revenues. So I thought that was um, some transparency level there from Ballotopedia, of course. That's Ballotopedia. That deserves almost a donation right there, doesn't it, to Ballotopedia? Yeah, I they're, think they're a great resource. Well, they did what the state government wouldn't even do. Uh, well, at least not in the ballot question. I that you know, and that's a, that's another thing that is upcoming that we should talk about with people that. The blue book process, we've got to add that in on the list, Brandon. The blue book process, how that blue book is fra framed, the language that's included, people can get involved in that pro process. And I've been involved in it for some years. But the, the blue book is that booklet that everybody gets in the mail. So you get your ballot and you get the blue book. The blue book covers the state issue. It's got an area for all the fiscal stuff. Some people want to read that. Maybe they don't. Maybe it makes their eyes glaze over. But then there's a pro and a con area. And the pro and con is where, especially we can weigh in as citizens and we can say, hey, legislative staff, we're on first draft of this blue book and then second draft. We want that exactly to say what Wikipedia is saying too. We want it to say what would otherwise be refunded to residents under the Colorado Taxpayers Bill of Rights because the legislature, they want to keep using um, Article 10, Section 20. Most people don't know off the top of their head what that is or that voter approved revenue change. That's what they used for years. But now they've slid so far down and off and again, you know, wanting to cheat and gain the system to simply refer to as surplus. So getting involved with the blue book process is another way that we can make a difference and that's gearing up right now. I'm on the, to, to put it in short, if people go to the Colorado Secretary of State website and go to, or no, I'm sorry, you got to go to the legislative website. So leg.colorado.gov. And then you go in uh, to just search Blue Book. There's a quick sign up. And if you sign up with your email, you can be involved with either of the two measures that are on this year's ballot. Great. That's huge. That's great information. And I'd, I'd love to do just a separate video on that as well. Just okay. a, something to share out with people, but I think that's very, very huge. So okay. perfect. Perfect. So kind of a, a, a taste here of what we're going to be talking about throughout this video series. Uh, as Natalie just mentioned, I'd love the blue book as well. But in addition, you know, kind of really trying to understand property taxes for those interested. And also, most importantly, give you the tools that you need to to fight back, to to lower the property taxes, to maybe challenge it, to actually keep some more, some more of your hard-earned money. Yes, we're going to be, I mean, I am most excited about where's the part we've got. Basically, we're going to have another bullet point there, how you can change your future and lower your property taxes. Or did we put that one in there? No, that's what we're going to be. No, not yet. That's what we're leading to. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> because if we just want to be a radio host or blog post with no solutions, well, then we'd be like a lot of others, but we want to be different. We're going to have great solutions. Way to get fired up. Fourth of yes, July, get... kind of fired up. Not like barbecue and craft beer. Like, tell the government, lower our taxes. That's what we want. You want affordable housing? Let me keep more of my money. Right. Let me afford it. Let me keep the money right. I earn so I can afford my housing and my groceries and my gas and all of my electricity bills. For sure. So I hope this was interesting and I hope it provided a useful background in, to people out there to understand where we're at in the property tax situation here in Colorado, how these politicians have used their political power to raise our ta property taxes under the guise of, you know, trying to be more fair, equitable, whatever you want to call it. And of course, now the latest scheme with Proposition HH, Senate Bill 303, is to steal our tax refund money, constitutionally guaranteed, and use it to funnel to local governments in lieu of pro missed property tax revenue. So absolutely and utterly despicable behavior. And there are solutions out there. So I hope to see you again on the next video. This will be great. Perfect. Any other parting words, Natalie? Uh, just that I'm really excited about doing this um, because I've done training a lot over years and um, people really do get excited about being empowered and 
that's that's a great thing. We don't we we've got a lot of possibilities, opportunity, and I think people will really enjoy this education they're going to get, and so that they don't feel helpless, and they're going to see hope and how they can make a difference. And when they say you can't beat City Hall, we're going to show them that you sure can. Awesome. Well, wonderful. I hope everybody uh, takes care. We'll see you next time.